let's just start. With, tell me your story. Oh man, how how long do we have? I have lots of different stories. I feel like that do lead to the same place, but they have different threads that tell a different element of each story. I grew up in California. Um, my parents are. Our, my parents work with an organization called Crew, um, and they work with the military. So they do mentoring, counseling, uh, support to military personnel. There, when I grew up, there were three military bases there, but um, now there's two. And so, um, just grew up around the military, but grew up surfing. My dad was a surfer, um, previously naval pilot. Wow. So yeah, just a kind of a. A fun random world. My parents, you know, work for working for a nonprofit. We didn't have a lot of money growing up, so uh, living in a very affluent area, not having a lot of money, ah, man, really changed uh, the trajectory of my life in a lot of good ways. I think um, had to think differently about things. Got to see life through multiple different perspectives, um, and then so grew up there. Went to school down in LA. Um, I mean, since we're talking about filmmaking, first came across, never thought I was creative, like never thought of myself as a creative until my senior year of high school. I took a um, AP English class and I had a teacher and she just, I'll never forget her first introducing me to looking at stories differently through a lens of literary criticism and looking at poetry differently and seeing symbolism and seeing how you can tell layers to a story without a singular thread like that you have multiple different elements that lead to a singular point and you have a certain story arc but she i mean just changed my perspective and all of a sudden i saw it as like this just mystical (laughs) avenue to approach life and to interpret life and so i dove headfirst in just fell in love with literature um, fast forward to my sophomore year of college, I had gone to a small little, uh, private Christian school down in LA, thought I was going to go into voc- vocational ministry. Um, and while I was there, I got a chance to live in Israel, went to Israel my sophomore year, freshman or uh, first semester of my sophomore year, lived over there and picked up a camera for the first time in my life. That wasn't a disposable. You're kidding. No. And picked up a camera. It was an, I want to say it was an old Olympus, one of the original Olympus digitals. So this is 2002. And while I was out there, I just, I took like 5,000 photos over that semester, which at the time I felt like it was a lot because I hadn't wow. started. Because you started as a photographer. Yeah, completely as a, I mean, I've only done, I started, I shot my first film this year. This is the first time I shot my first film. You're a kid. How old are you? I'm 40. No way. Yeah. So I um, went to uh, or came back from Israel and was looking at the photos and was like, I had a lot of fun doing it, but I didn't know if anything was any value. And people were like, oh, these are really cool. And I was like, wow, people like them and I like them. I should do this more. And that just began an obsession where I just kept on shooting Apprenticed under a photographer in Monterey after college. Um, He was a wedding photojournalist, um, but also a fine art photographer and just learned heaps from him. Never thought I was going to be able to make a career out of it. Still like was like, I don't even know how to do this. So fast forward. Were you married? Did you have kids at that time? Nope. Didn't get married until 28. So that was, I lived in California until 2008 moved out here to Colorado in 2008 because I decided that I had the brain to go to grad school but I didn't have the money (laughs) so I was like I need to change a pace ended up in Denver um or in Boulder specifically uh moved out to help start a church that was getting started out here and thought I'd just launch my photography career so while I did that I ended up working at university bicycles here in town and one thing led to another. I thought it was just going to be a building block, but then they wanted me, I did sales for them. And then they were like, Hey, you should be a buyer and merchandiser for us. So I did that for a few years. And then another cycling apparel came, company came to me, Pac Timo, and we're like, Hey, we really want to launch this retail brand, um, online direct to consumer. Can you help us? And that was new to the cycling industry. And so they brought me on to kind of be that manager of that and help launch that did that for five years. And then, 
during my time at the bike shop before I joined Pac Timo, that's when I met my wife. She was working at Starbucks. Um, and that's the other thread of my story. So I, the only reason that I got to meet my wife is because I was currently in a, uh, recovery program, uh, here in Boulder out of, there's a church called Cornerstone that has a recovery program, um, called Celebrate Recovery. And I was a part of that. And I would do my homework for each week at Starbucks. And so I would sit there cause it was the only place that was open late at night that would cost the least amount of money. And she was working at night. And so we just kind of developed a friendship over time. Um, and you know, the only reason I bring that up is not only was it important for me meeting her, but I think that recovery program, that process of battling addiction, the empathy that comes from that, the, you know, decades of wrestling with addiction and then seeing the, the resulting work that it takes to move through that, the dependency on others, the recognition of my own frailty, um, all of that has been instrumental, I think, in, in bringing me to the point of being able to, to listen, tell stories and capture people, uh, in a unique way. How did you, what was it? Yeah. You got to tap into that. Tell me about the addiction stuff. Yeah. So, um, you know, I grew up in a, a small conservative Christian home. Um, I mean, my parents are, are rad. They're not like what you would prototypically think of as Americana Christianity. Um, but they also, you know, it was, it was pretty, they were reacting to growing up in a, in a culture where, you know, my mom was a, was uh, a druggie and um, my dad, you know, grew up in a really broken home and just like had a, so when their lives changed, they changed everything. But then I grew up in that and it was pretty strict um, structured environment since it's changed a lot as a family, as we've worked through a lot of the things. Um, but I think as of, out of that, I started to really, I don't even think it's rebellion, just like had an attraction to exploring sexuality and so I developed an addiction to pornography in college really is when it kind of, when I started to identify it as an addiction. And so, I, I mean, I would say my journey of recovery began there because I started being honest with other people. I wasn't wow, h- man. hiding it. I wasn't silent about it. I mean, yeah, obviously, yeah. you know, like any addiction, you know, you hide, you find your ways around things, but then that led to basically a, a, pretty severe mental breakdown, not just because of that, but I started questioning things. My senior year of college, I was studying literary criticism and postmodern theory, reading a lot of Friedrich Nietzsche, and that just wrecked my worldview as I was trying to process everything. And you combine that with struggling with this sense of worth, recognizing I'm consistently failing. And my perspective on religion and faith at the time was that I needed to perform to have, to have value, to have worth, um, very American approach to anything in life. And as you know, that just, my foundations were kind of crumbling beneath me. I just came to a place of, well, is life worth living? And I'll never forget being in the fetal position on my apartment floor in my senior year of college and just asking the question, like, or coming to the place of, I know existentialism doesn't work for me, and that's the only other option. I either believe in God, or if I choose existentialism, nihilism makes a lot more sense, <laughs> and so I might as well kill myself because there's no other point. Um, and thankfully, I would say by grace alone, I didn't choose suicide at that moment, and instead began that journey of recovery that. I would say really, I mean, it, it's still ongoing. I never yeah, really yeah. think that it's stopped, but yeah, that was the first time I've been through a few rounds of addiction recovery, um, programs. And then, um, I would say that that, that community and then now medication have been the three things that have really been the healing elements in that, in that process, which you know, still to this day, my wife is my biggest ally in all of this. Wow. So you've had like, I mean, the film story is one thing, but what a lot of people don't yeah. realize is behind the filmmakers, this whole other story of their, what really is their life? Yeah. I mean, I think it, 
that leads to story. I think the best stories come from that place. I mean, I've always had a, ever since I started getting into just artistic endeavors and studying literate literature and, and looking at it, I've always felt like the best art is produced from pain and that, you know, you don't, you don't recognize light unless you have shadow. You don't see the beauty unless you have some context to compare it against in our context at least there might be some other way to yeah, visualize yeah. beauty, but I think something that's beautiful, if that's all you see, then that's normal. Yeah. But I think that for us, we understand hope. We understand, uh, conflicts and resolution in the context. So it's either the mundane and then chaos, like take like the Joker film, you know, where it's, it's trying to, paint this story and there's a beauty in it but the beauty is that it's taking this mundane like Truman Show-esque life and then it goes into turmoil and how does someone get to that and I think conversely you you can't create that without paying yourself you can't lean into someone's story and no good story is without conflict so I would say I bet every filmmaker you dig a little bit deeper, you scratch beneath the surface like a scratch and sniff sticker. You'll sniff out pain in there. The gr in documentary, especially it's, when you start to get into some of these more difficult stories, having the gift of empathy and being able to, I think that transcends through the, the lens a lot, mm -hmm. but you have to know it, mm -hmm. you know, but I think a lot, especially an impact documentary, we're trying to move the audience to, participate in something that maybe they don't necessarily want to spend time on mm. um, creating a connection with the character where they know that you feel behind the camera. You can, for some reason you can just feel that. Mm. I don't know if you've experienced that. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, being a, being a dad of two foster kids and just walking through their trauma and learning with them about, um, what it means to walk through life and trauma in a, in a context where a lot of people just don't understand foster care. Um, you know, you hear people and I would agree with this. I would just add something, but you hear people talk about like foster care and they say, well, the foster care system is broken. And I would say, yes, it is, but it's also the best broken system that we have. And, you know, I experienced that firsthand as a foster parent, you experience the brokenness of the system, but you also get in it and you're like, it's there for a reason. Yeah, so my, so our friends Michael. adopted, right? Yeah. And it just, the power of love has just transformed this kid's life. And now they brought in, you know, they got pregnant. They've got another kid that is going to grow up in this environment. And it's mm. this, this crazy mm. thing to watch. And he's a film director. Oh, and that's so, awesome. Yeah, he's he, he does really, he produced for me. And then um, we did Rising from Ashes together. And then he's like, I want to go into narrative. And so then he just took off and... They're Man. doing big movies now, which is fun. <laughs> That's way set. cool. You know? The uh, Rising from Ashes was like, I've watched that before I even knew who you were and before I was super into film. Um, just being in the cycling industry, I came across it because I worked in um, with a crew in Zambia for a while. And so any connection to some of those African uh, countries surrounding that area, I'm like in love with. Oh, dude. So. Yeah, that one was... I, we just talked about this recently is I don't know how that movie got made. Mm. Yeah. That was a, that was seven years, but it was, and then we were on the release for like three. No way. Mm -hmm. So wow. it kind of takes it. We were there and yeah, that's the thing is when you get into these bigger stories, I think shorts are really fun because you get to learn a lot from them, but they're quick. Mm. But then the feature, it's like, I don't know. It like puts hair on your chest or something. It's like the, you kind of see it. It's just a big thing, mm. you know, and then with Africa and, you know, you got funding and it was just super risky, mm. you know, like things were, you never knew if the film was actually going to get completed. So it kind of puts you in this weird spot all the time of, is this actually going to go down? You know, mm. and then, then it finally did. So. Was that your first feature? Um, no, I'd actually done a film before that call hearing Everett. Okay. So my, yeah, my backstory was that I worked for young life up in steamboat, made a movie with a feature with a friend of mine, Ryan, we had literally no idea what we we're doing. So we made this really horrible feature. It played once somebody in the audience said, do you want to, 
you know, do you want to do some docs in Africa? And I was like, yeah, I'd love docs. I'd never done a documentary. So they paid us to go over there for six weeks and film the, the big five animals. No and way. So I went with my buddy, Brian, his career took off. He was in the Himalayas a month later. Wow. And then uh, I met a photographer who a guy named John Russell, who lived in Aspen, but he lived in Hawaii and was like, he's the number one published photographer in Patagonia's history. So. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm pretty sure I know his work. I yeah, was like, yeah. that name sounds so familiar. Yeah. So John, um, let me shoot over his shoulder and then I start shooting video. Then realized I needed to move someplace besides steamboat. So I moved to LA, worked for Nat Geo discovery, start doing mm. that deal. But what kind of ultimately happened is I just started feeling like, you know, I'm a cam I'm a shooter, but I'm not a DP, mm -hmm. but that's what I wanted to do. But then I met this guy named John Holmes on a set and I said, how many days are you gone a year? And he said, 276, 287 next year. And I said, do you have a family? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, TC, this is the career. And I realized at that point, I was like, this isn't what I want to do, but I yeah. didn't know a way out. And so ironically, people started asking me to direct. Then I got on board with this, um, CNN deal doing this piece on a guy named Rick Warren. Mm -hmm. And so I went to Rhonda with him. We became friends. And then he called me up and said, Hey, do you want to hang out and do this thing? I'm going around the world looking at the five biggest problems. Do you want to go with me? And so I spent 18 months with him going to 60 countries and just blew my worldview. Hmm. Like I had this, you know, I had my worldview of my faith and kind of what I thought Hollywood was and stories. And then all of a sudden I was like, here's the world. And we were able to bring stories back to people that had maybe we'll never go there and they could create a connection. Mm. And then my mom got cancer and, uh, moved back to Santa Barbara to be with her. Mm. And she died 10 months later. And then I was like, she's 67. I was 35. I was like, let's get to it. Mm. Phone rings. And it's this nonprofit in Baja, Mexico. And they were working with deaf kids. And so we did this docudrama it was like a lot of reenactments. It was super fun. It took mm. three years and that, and that went out and that was kind of my people knew I was not messing around after that. Was that hearing Everett? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh man. I have so many questions. <laughs> I, I feel like I should be running this podcast and asking you all the questions. <laughs> Cause I think like, uh, I've been building out with this new team I'm a part of, um, I'm building out just different, like looking at each documentary style saying, how could we, what could we accomplish? And like the two that I've identified that I'm like, I don't even know where to begin. One would be just reflexive, like about ourselves. I just don't think that way. Like, you know, I, that's why I like being behind the camera, not in front of it. Yeah. Um, and then the second was just like reenactment oh. narratives. Cause I'm just like it. I mean, narrative work alone seems so intimidating to me. I don't know why. I just see the world better as a journalist than I do as a creator of it. Well, I'll tell you, the, the number one thing I learned from that, the gold, don't let them talk. And you mm. can cast anybody. That's a great point. Yeah. The second their voice hits, it's something and it triggers you and takes mm. you out of it. So as long as they don't talk, it works. That's, that's crazy. Well, and I'm sure the blocking has to be really good then if you're just casting anyone or you have to create a scenario that that person can step into yeah, effectively. I mean, the, the main character was laying tile and I was like, do you think that guy would dye his hair black? And they're like, I don't know, ask him. He was like volunteering on some missions trip and he was like on his knees. I was like, Hey dude, can I talk to you? And he's like, yeah. And he just had the look. That's great. And so we kind of hung out and he kind of had confidence, you know, but he was it, quiet. And I love that. So I said, can you put on a little weight? Can you dye your hair black? And he did it. And then we would just block and work with him. But then he just never talked. He'd have to walk in, pick up a phone, get in a car, drive. And then those scenarios went from like Baja, Mexico to all the way to North Carolina. And then when we did a time piece, it really stretched because mm. we were bringing cars in and clothes and makeup artists that kind of made the thing look real mm -hmm. and then we kind of chose to shoot that at the time there was no depth of field cameras so this mm -hmm. thing came out called a, a red rock micro mm. i don't know if you've ever uh -uh. Heard no really? i want to hear about this dude it was this box and it had a piece of glass in it and um red rock the company made it and it spun around and you put this nine volt battery on the side and it would spin and it would flip the image upside down, but it would give you depth of field and it would give you this beautiful grain. And nobody knew about it 
Well, there's a, that's not true. There's a lot of people using it, but they didn't, it was still new. Yeah. But I met this DP who had this Panasonic camera and he had figured out this LUT where he had stretched the colors and I love the LUT. Mm. So I called him and I said, Hey, we come DP this. And so the deal was, I didn't know if he was like that great of a DP, but I knew it was really good, but I didn't know it was that good. He gets down there, but I wanted the LUT. Yeah. And then he starts shooting. I was like, this guy's crushing it. So we spent three years. David's still a good friend. That's amazing. But the camp, that camera was like, I mean, it was two feet long. So you actually had to treat it like a cinema camera. Right. And then we had a three person crew and a bunch of old Nikon lenses. And that look, even today, people are like, you know, she's 16 or 35. I was yeah. like, no. Yeah. So. I mean, I just finished building out my set of Nikon AIS lenses. Yeah. I have a full set now. Well, I don't have the 20 or the 18 yet. I'm looking at which one I want to get. But yeah, 24, 35, or 24, 28, 35, 50, 85, and 105. And I mean, I'm in love with it. Pull up to that thing a little bit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in love with it. It's so good. Yeah. I mean, it, we still have them. But so that look, the time period, the casting is kind of the magic sauce of what mm. made that for a time piece. But as far as the re reenactment stuff, I just tried to think through kind of, how do we make this real that you connect with the character, but you don't feel like you're taken out of the scene by any distractions. Mm -hmm. And man, the thing, that was a great film. I mean, I really, and then we start, but then we really start implementing kind of from a, an impact side. That's where I really started to learn that film could move audience from viewer to participant. Mm. And how we did that was by partnering with that school, knowing that there was opportunities for the audience to come down there and engage. But the second piece was, that the process was as important as the finish. Mm. So all of a sudden I realized like the lights were going on for the cast that were volunteering. So I think we had 350 volunteers on that film No way. and what would have cost us, I don't know, eight or $900,000 cost us like two. Mm. But what we started to see is that like we needed to get to Baja Mexico to this little fishing village and we didn't have any way to get there. So I said, well, wait, there's these Baja bush pilots in Santa Barbara. They love flying. And somebody knew somebody, we called them, they're like, we want to give our planes to the film. Well, they had purpose behind their passion. Yeah. And so all of a sudden they were serving and that just opened up these crazy doors for people to be, say, I want to, I want on board with this because it's mm -hmm. not just a film, it's something bigger. Yeah. And that, those are like the components that started to come through that came, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And do you feel like that's like drives a lot of the work now still like that Everything. same? Yeah. Do you still work with volunteers on a lot of your projects or is it? It depends on the film. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's always that person. You probably get this all the time. Yeah. Oh, can I just carry your bags for you? <laughs> and it's like, no, because then I got to feed you, house you, worry about you. Like the <laughs> yeah. environments we go into are dangerous. Like, yeah. So um, if it's the right scenario, we always look for those opportunities every time. But the last part is like at the end, you got to let people know that they were part of this project, that you mm. couldn't have done it without them. So serving your, serving your, those, your crew and being thankful. Mm -hmm. That's cool. That's really cool. I've been a, super inspired by, I don't know if you're familiar with the guys over at neighborhood films. Oh my gosh. They just, the way that they're working with, you know, one, I just care deeply about previously incarcerated people uh, and just the, the struggle it is to step back into society. But just the work that they do one, they're phenomenal. <laughs> directors dude those guys crush it yeah i mean the cage that short film hands down is still one of my favorite short films of all time like it's just done so perfectly yeah i mean it's no wonder they got a feature out of it <laughs> yeah so well so you're working so your faith is a big part of your your driver but then you also work at a church yes so that's kind of a most churches aren't known for having guys like you on their staff. Yes. Tell me about that. <laughs> uh, um, well, it wasn't something that I thought I was going to do. I'll put it that way. Um, it wasn't in the cards. And so I was, yeah, let me give the fast forward version. Last, so in 20, so 2022, yeah. Yeah. Just July of last year, so a year and a half ago, 
I made the choice to step out of being a brand strategist. Um, I'm working in the marketing realm and go back full time into photography. I was kind of splitting the two and I was like, you know what? I'm tired of doing this. Like I want to do what I love again. Um, and it was like the perfect time. I, my boys were just about to start going into school full time. And so I knew that I would have more capacity. I was a stay at home dad um, when we were first fostering them. And then, um, so I started doing that, started building my career, but it was all photography, all stills based. And my, uh, I told, I remember telling my wife, I said, I'm, she was like, what about video? Everybody was like, oh, you should do video too, diversify. And I was like, nah, I know I can make it with just photography. Like I know I can do that. Um, and I just told her, I said, I'm not going to do a film unless someone pays me to do it. Well, lo and behold, <laughs> like two months later, this would be last October, uh, an agency here in Boulder, um, reached out to me and they were like, Hey, we have this project. You know, I had been trying to pitch them to get some stills work from them, um, with a few of their clients. And they were like, yeah, we got this project. We don't, the quote that we got was way too high. It was with an insurance company. And so I was like, well, I'll put together a uh, proposal. And I, I mean, I literally had no idea what I was doing and I just wrote a proposal together. They were like, sure, this looks great. Next thing I know, uh, I was filming in Grand Junction for a national <laughs> insurance company You're and kidding. doing this piece solo it was like the such a hard gig. Never had run an interview in my life. Had no clue what I was going to come out of it. But while I was sitting there, I was like, this is going to be the most boring job ever because all I'm doing is shooting an interview. And I sat there and just hearing stories and being able to pull stuff out of people. And like, I mean, we're talking about insurance, but it was, I was able to create genuine human connections and it showed me, I was like, wow, I love interviewing people. Like this is so fun. Yeah. And that just began the trajectory. I mean, that was, so that was my first commercial project. I was like just knee deep in studying film for the next, I mean, they bought basically that project bought my initial equipment that December I joined uh, a group called the Art of Documentary. Yeah, started taking their courses because I had exhausted every YouTube video <laughs> that I could find out there. Tell me um, about AOD. Yeah, oh my goodness, AOD is amazing. Like I'm a huge, huge fan. I mean, I think what they've done for the documentary community in kind of revitalizing. I mean, Mark Bone and his work on YouTube, I think, has really connected with a lot of filmmakers. Yeah. Um. So to for him to then also just preach the value of documentary in our context and give people a, a deeper understanding of why it's value. It's not just another genre, but it's an important part of um, just a cultural makeup, I think in the creative arts. Um, and so he, um, that's how I got connected with them. You know, I was, you know, I think they've been running for a year, year or so when I joined, uh, and I devoured, I mean, literally within a month I had gone through all their courses that I could. I mean, I was folding laundry, listening to it, just yeah. like anytime I wasn't on a, uh, a photo shoot or editing. Uh, and even when I was editing, I was just listening constantly. So I knew that I needed to start building out my, um, my reel. And so that's when I did a quick reel that's still on my site <laughs> that I shot on my one DX Mark two and just through that you know, photography lenses, threw that together, put that together, just asked a few friends and was like, Hey, can I shoot you? Can I do this? Um, put that all together. And then the next thing I did is I was like, I got to tackle my first film. So during, during that process, um, I didn't, our, my wife and I's counselor, um, through fostering, he has a ranch called groundwork ranch. And that was my first documentary was a pony named Ren for their ranch. And it was really just a, kind of a spec piece, but I knew I didn't want to just do a spec commercial. I wanted to do something that had meaning similar to what you're saying. Like, I just don't like doing things if they don't have purpose. Like if I don't feel like this is going to actually have an impact in some facet, then I'm like, why well, do it? Like it just, it's not motivational to me. I don't like creating for, and I don't even think it's necessarily bad to do this, but I don't like creating just for the sake of creating. Um, to me, I always have the audience in my, I always have someone in mind. It's not just for me. You know, if I'm, if I don't have a reason, I don't pick up a camera typically. Yeah. And, um, so yeah, that 
That well, was a good film, bro. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank I mean, you. It, the way that you structured that as far as being able to kind of, you created empathy for this mm. horse through its th- this backstory, but then how quickly you brought in the characters, the caregivers of that and the pa- I just kept thinking about the patience mm. that it takes. I mean, it, it, it was just a little profound little hit where you're just kind of going, whoa, this is way bigger than a horse. I mean, it's a great piece. Oh, thank you. Thank you for saying that. I mean, I think that that means a lot just saying that because that was my whole goal was like, how do I tell, you know, it's a very personal story to me because I was like, how do I tell what it's like? Use this horse to depict what it's like for my sons to go through life. Like the horse to me the whole time. I mean, I still, you know, the, the rancher, um, caregiver of Ren, she says in there, she says, survival is the greatest reinforcement for behavior that there is. And I have to remember that when I'm caring for Ren. And like, I can't tell you how many days as a father I've sat with my boys and just thought, I have to remember this. Like the actions they're taking feel personal, but really the reality is they're just trying to survive. And, um, yeah, it, yeah, just to know that it made that, I mean, I'm so thankful that that piece is out there and being used because, you know, my whole hope was just to draw more attention to the incredible work they do with that ranch. Yeah. And just, I mean, foster parents are so often the last person anyone thinks about when they think about the system. And when you're in the system, you're the last person anybody thinks about, even though you're the primary connection to the child. Yeah. Well, you, you, we, you know, we have this film that we've wanted to do for, I don't know, a decade called taking care of your parents Mm. because as your parents get older, you become the caregiver, but nobody's taking care of the caregiver. Mm. So it's like, they're getting worn out. I mean, I've got two friends and they were just shot Mm. taking care of their parents through cancer and everything else. And it's it's like, well, who's caring for you? Right. Because if you go down, then the system's broken. Right. And it's no different with this horse ranch. It's like mm-hmm. they have to be cared for too. Cause they're, they're providing respite for people who need a break mm-hmm. and need some help. So, yeah. And I mean, that that's, I love that idea. I can't wait for you guys to start that idea because I think that is a, I think it would speak to a lot of people and we have it, you know, rapidly aging. Oh my gosh. The boomer generation is, you know, my parents. Yeah. Like they're aging. I mean, we're, me and my siblings are having those conversations and with my parents. It's not outside of them, not behind, you know, their, their backs, but in with them, just like, Hey, we want to, and thankfully my parents are like, Hey, we don't want to leave you with a burden. We don't want, we want to talk with you now and no. And, but I mean, it's, it's a regular conversation. You have a relationship with your parents. Yes. And it was, it's really interesting kind of going back to the film side of it is that we wanted to do a movie of it, but nobody wants to watch that movie. Right. So we've had to rethink it and mm. it's, we definitely have a strategy for it. But, um, going through that with my mom with cancer, Oh man, like, I don't know. I mean, I've mourned, but I'm like to dive back into that. It's yeah, that's been painful. Yeah. It's just different. You know, you're kind of like, I've got to dump, I've got to kind of emotionally check in mm-hmm. to stories, but I'll be honest with you. The best part of that story is the humor. Mm. because mm-hmm. it's the biggest, you know, they say humor, the best humor is irony. Yes. We're all going to die. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, and it's layers of irony because now you're in the same position you were as an infant, Oh, totally. right? Like as an adult, now you're being cared for, you're shitting your diaper <laughs> and now you're, you're in that same, same place. You know, I think, yeah, there's so, you know, we, we talk about as foster parents, we, we talk about how you, you develop this very dark humor that can quickly move to cynicism and you definitely have to constantly check your own heart and yeah. just because that no one's going to be served by cynicism. Um, but dark humor, on the other hand, just you, you have to laugh. Sometimes that's all you have left, you know, when your world is just chaos and feels like it's breaking at the seams everywhere all you have left is sometimes it's just to laugh at the irony of like how out of control you are in that context. Oh man, that, that is in the dirt. Mm. What was happening behind the scenes? 
Mm-hmm. So here's the story about cycling in the Navajo Nation. The amount of humor that was happening, I mean, it is the best. Those are the funniest characters I've ever worked with in a film. That's as a amazing. Cast. Oh, bar none. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I mean, they are, they, their sense of humor, the irony, the, the, just that sarcasm. Yeah. Like, they know their circumstance, and they're not... Um, they have humor to things, but there's mm. a truth behind it. And that's the cutting part that mm. like, it's very borderline, but my gosh, it brings things to the surface that you need to talk about. Mm. And, you know, I remember one day I kind of knew in that film that we had crossed in where they were trusting us is I walked in a room with a friend of mine, Scott, who's in the film and this whole room of people just start going at us. I mean, Oh, the white guys are here. And I was like, <laughs> I don't know where this is going and <laughs> they just unleashed and it was the funniest stuff. That's awesome. And I, and I walked out and I was like, well, what, what just happened? And they're like, you're accepted. That's when, you, awesome. when you're made fun of in their culture, they're like, that's when you're in. Yes. It's if you don't get made fun of and you're ignored, that's when you need to maybe pack your bags. And uh-huh. I didn't know any of that down there. Well, that's beautiful. I love that. Yeah. I mean, I love, I love humor. I'm not, I don't, I don't lean into humor as a natural go-to. Like my wife and I, we talk about this, like she leads with humor. That's like a way to connect with people for her initially. Whereas humor for me is like, when I start being funny, you know that I trust you because it's a very sacred part of me, which is weird, but it's also a tool that I use a lot in interviewing or when I was doing photography with, you know, portrait subjects is one of the best ways I've found is to like, lean in kind of the lean into the awkwardness at the beginning. Then at some point, once you've established some rapport, press in with humor and then follow up with like the deepest question you want to ask right after the humor, because it's, it's like this piece that just unlocks this opportunity and you have to seize it and you jump in and it throws people off and they're off their guard. And all of a sudden they're giving you the best either facial expression for a portrait or they're giving the most authentic response in an interview. Yeah, people don't realize in film, especially in documentary, it, that breaking down that wall, if you can't break down that wall, it's it's just textbook. Mm-hmm. There's, just, there's no human mm-hmm. nature to it. It's crazy. Yeah, you lose the story. I mean, yeah, that's my biggest thing that I've learned with shorts, I would say, is like how hard it is sometimes. Because you're typically, we're, you know, like even the Ren story, thankfully I had a little bit of a relationship with them, but, you know, I had I shot that in two days you know, and almost every piece I've ever done, I've done in less than three days. And in terms of actual filming time, and usually the interviews, I get an hour and a half and that's the only interview I'll do with that person. Wow. And so it's, it's so hard to like figure out how do I dive deep enough to get to that authentic element in that human relatable narrative and get past even the circumstances and the story that they've developed, but get into the emotion that drives that or the experience, the internal experience in that circumstance. Cause it, like you said, the circumstance is just going to be a story that could be in a history book. What makes it a narrative is when you get to experience them in that circumstance. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I had a client years ago that, uh, we've done a bunch of film projects docs together. We did like 30 short docs together and we did the first two. The first one was a complete bust Hmm. because I just said, Oh yeah, I've done this. We flew up there and uh, it was an up in Oregon and we interviewed the guy and he didn't tell us everything. Hmm. So all of a sudden his wife wasn't his wife. It was the secretary he had an affair with. And so we had planned this thing that he was going to get together with his kids that night. Well, they had never been to his house. So like everybody agreed, but nobody told us that like they didn't, they hadn't reconciled. So we're shooting the scene in the backyard. They're all sitting next to this fire before dinner. And it is, I mean, you could have cut the tension with a knife. It was so awkward. And I was like, I'll never do this again. Cause I've never, I've never done a film without pre-scouting it like that. Yeah. They're like, we're tight on the budget. And I was like, it's kind of far off the grid. So it was a bunch of regional airports to get there. Well, after that, I said, look, there has to be a budget 
to go pre-scout it with no cameras so I can see it, see what, how they treat their dog. Then we'll know if mm-hmm. it's a good story, but I won't, I, I would never do it without pre-scouting it anymore if it was a client based deal with them, because it was just, Oh man, that first one, it was, that was a rough one. That's, that's hard. I mean, you're like, now you're stepping into someone's personal life in a way that if they haven't told you that, then now the cat's out of the bag in a weird way. That's weird. Oh yeah. Cause the kids knew. So all of a sudden they're sitting at dinner and that's where like some of the stuff that I get really excited about is like, where's that, when's that little magic moment going to happen? Mm-hmm. And that did like all of a sudden we pulled off from shooting this dinner, got, I mean, it, we just had to keep shooting and shooting until you kind of found these little mm-hmm. moments that would work. And then all of a sudden it just broke down mm-hmm. and they started talking to each other and later came to find out that it was, it was actually a really cool story. It's about generosity. Mm. And so this guy, his son wanted to buy the business and mm. he didn't want to give it to his son because he didn't know he was going to do with it. And then, um, come to find out like through that dinner and other things that happened after he, that guy ended up dying in the last couple of years. Wow. Um, he was older. Yeah. Yeah. Not that that's okay. He's just older. Right. But, um, <laughs> it's okay. He's older. He's older. <laughs> we all die. Yeah. You know, that. <laughs> but he, uh, his son ended up giving away, ended up inheriting the company and buying it. And then I found out through a friend, he gave away this crazy amount of money in honor of his father. Wow. And so I was like, wow. Like to be part of that in some ancillary way was mm-hmm. really cool. But being in relationship with people over time is pretty, it was pretty rad. That's, that's crazy. How often when you're filming, do you find the story changing in the middle of the project? I mean, I think it, and I mean like, like full, like, like that, oh, where, flip. It, where it almost flips on you or like you're going for one story. Like I, I think of like the narrative behind Icarus. Mm-hmm. And just how that completely shifted midstream for him of what his initial intent was. And then all of a sudden he's like, well, this is a completely different story that I wasn't anticipating. It's a lot bigger, but even that still was in the vein, but there's times where I feel like I'm, I'm in and I'm listening to an interview and I'm like, well, that's not the story I thought was there, but there's a completely different story here that I want to tell. Yeah. I mean, I, to be honest with that hasn't happened that many times to me just because a lot of that comes down to funding is mm. that we have to be so uh, accurate because we're answering to somebody who is either a patron to a film. That's a good point. And so out of respect for that relationship, it's like I don't want there to be some second act twist where they didn't know something mm. or there wasn't something that was clear. If something goes south that we couldn't control, I get that. Right. But on the Most of the time, our research phase is pretty intense. Like we figure out our you know, one of the things like we've got this kind of doc program that we're putting together. That's like, I love AOD from the sense of learning how to make documentaries, but the business of documentaries Mm -hmm. is a little different. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we teach in the, in the uh, development phase is we actually put together our distribution strategy, our impact strategy, our marketing strategy in development. Mm. So we kind of know our target audience and those things, but it forces us to kind of really sift through where the characters are at. And is this thing going to be kind of go a different direction? There was, an, there was a Sundance film a few years ago about a guy who was going up to talk about an environmental film mm-hmm. uh, in Oklahoma. And so he started just going up and doing some research, found this pastor of this church and that all these oil guys didn't have any place to live. So they ended up living in this church and then it ended up this guy was gay and he was having these affairs with these men. And I mean, it was like, and I remember finishing that film and I was like, whoa, like this. And I talked to the, uh, my friend, Gerilyn Dreyfus, and I said, Gerilyn, you know, you're producing on this film. I saw it Sundance or somewhere. I don't remember, but, and I asked her about it and I said, I said, Gerilyn, she goes, man, wasn't that intense? She goes, he had no idea, wow. but now he's in it. And so he's just a true documentarian. And I was like, this dude is. Not- is that Overnighters? Yes. Yes. North yeah, Dakota. North Dakota. That one was so powerful. Yeah, okay. and he didn't know. He was That's doing amazing. It and so all of a sudden, it, very powerful film, though. Yeah. About kind of choices. A lot. Yeah, and the, just the, the racial components, 
to like the yes like the undertones there were like so many layers that he didn't like because it was so cinema verite like he just like was like a fly on the wall oh that just gosh. showed up into this chaos but the lifestyle that goes along with that title shoot I, I probably have pulled back from that mm. so mm -hmm. you know things that kind of go for years they're unpredictable as i get older you kind of veer what you kind of know a little bit of like what's going to happen in some mm -hmm. things and so we just don't mm -hmm. you know i'll 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 help people make those films. Yeah. Like we have a, a guy that we work with. He's like, I found this story in South Africa. It's this crazy story about this choir. I can't really say much more about it, but he basically went and did the research and he's like, yeah, it's going to be a four year film. And I was like, oh. get ready. You're 22. Like, this is it. Wow. But that could fall apart. It right. could happen. But I was like, I'm not getting on that train at 50. Yes. Just, I'm not, I don't want to do that as no. much anymore. It's, it's tough. I mean, I've, I think I've, <laughs> I've happened into, in a sense, about as close as I could get to an ideal job for right now for the season of life. Cause, cause being a dad of two young boys, I mean, my boys are seven and six. And so, you know, every day that I'm away, that I'm not working regular hours, it takes a toll on them and on my wife um, who works full time. And so, yeah, it's just, I have to count that cost. So it, in the same way that you're describing like just the pre-research for a film, like for me that I'd say all the time, my wife's my executive producer because you know, without her, I wouldn't be able to do anything like, and we're, I'm actually going to create a production company for her for our future films because I'm like, she needs that credit because she's oh, like yeah. hugely involved in every film. Anyways, she's like my best critic. I love showing stuff to her cause she's ruthless in the best, way yeah um but yeah it's it's definitely like i've thought about that like to me feature length right now shorts are so perfect because that's the time i have and i have like ideas like i just watched american symphony um oh, heineman's new film yeah a, easily one of the best films i've ever watched really i would say i think it's i think he is doing something different with documentaries than i've seen in other filmmakers like he's just he's he just you can tell he thinks deeply i would love to pick his brain one day just because i just it's cool to watch i mean to go from retrograde where he's documenting this military officer in this pullout which is big and broad and and then to do this story where it's so intimate and i, I don't know that's just like there's those are such different contexts like you're now in affluent new york versus being in Afghanistan in a war torn situation that's moving from bad to worse. Yeah. Uh, but all that to say it's daunting to think about like doing a feature of that length and that magnitude because of the amount of time commitment it is well, for it. Well, I think, you know, it, when I look at features now, it's, 50% my life and then 50% what the film is. So the 50% is what's my lifestyle every day, the relationships I'm in, my burn rate financially, all those mm. different things. And then how much do I, is this film worth it to me? Because, you know, we try to batch like with, with, uh, in the dirt, we'll go down for, we would go down for a week and then we were like, this isn't working. So we go down for these big stretches of like sometimes 14, 18 days. Mm. Well, I'm not home. We're right. not home, you know? And, you're outside, you know, you're living in hotel rooms and traveling every day. It's a grind. So, but those batching is how we were able to make up the time, but mm. still you miss a lot because you're not there in the day to day. Yep. So I always think about it now. It's like, where are the local stories where you can be in your own bed at night? That's really key. Or can you just move there? Do you mm. have the infrastructure of your life to be able to say, Hey, I'm really excited about this. I want to move to this city for a year and just be there and be in it mm -hmm. and knowing that, that that's the most financially viable way of doing those type of films. Mm. That would, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. Like I think, excuse me, my experience with living in Israel, like I would say, you know, I was there for four and a half months. It wasn't until like about six weeks in that I start to feel like, Oh, now I'm really seeing where I live. Like, before then, you're just walking around like a tourist. 
But after six weeks, I was like, oh, now I, now I get it. Now it feels like it's starting to, f- not that it's home, but it feels like it's, it's where I'm living. Um, and people became people I interact with instead of just an acquaintance that I'm visiting. Yeah. And it, it changed definitely my perspective on Israel for sure. Wow. Spending that long there. And I think the same's got to be with a st- some of those stories, you know. I think I'm currently starting to think through. All right, what does it look like for me to pursue a multi-year journey with a project, and what story has that merit? Because I always love mundane stories. I like trying to make mundane things beautiful, things that we miss. The finding the the stories that just seem simple, because I think there's a story in every single one, and I yeah. think mundane things are very relatable and very intriguing. Um. But yeah, thinking that through, like, how do I do that within the context of working a full-time job where I could do part of it as a part of the job if I find the right story, but also just alone, like, how do I work? I like working solo sometimes too. As a filmmaker, it's just, I don't know, as a documentary filmmaker, sometimes it's fun to just not have any other distraction unless you're doing like an interview and, you know, you have, you're building out lighting, but I love just holding the camera and just being around somebody. Uh, we, ch- I mean, in the last, what I figured out was m- my magic sauce was that I was just, I like people. Mm. And so we took a 16 person crew one time to Rwanda for part of that production. And like two days in, I just stripped the whole thing down. I said, I need Jeremy and I need Sean sound guy and my camera guy. Mm. And I said, the rest of this, we got to rethink the whole thing. And I mean, Greg was so mad. Mm. And I said, how can we look at what we need to shoot? let these other guys shoot that. And then for the stuff we need, the three of us go and get it because the intimacy was, we were leaving it on the Mm -hmm. table because people were saying there's just too much Mm -hmm. production and people. And so we just stripped it down and that's majority where that film came from. And then we would go back and my uh, friend, Jeff Waldron, who I don't know how I got to work with Jeff, but then he went, you know, he does huge stuff now for Disney and, you know, some of these big stuff, but Jeff, Greg and I flew over there and, the heart of that film came from the three of us. Greg read his book mm. and would do sound sometimes. And Jeff had a DSLR and That's all awesome. the intimate moments came because Jeff knew just how to be in the room and be quiet and still. And the characters, I didn't realize how much people want to be free. Mm. They don't want to hold their stuff in. They mm. want to, they, they want, they don't, they want to be known mm. and truthful they don't want to live in secrets. So I think everybody does yeah. at some level. Like, I think that's the thing that being a foster parent has taught me hmm. is that, you know, my, I have a friend I went to college with, he's got a crazy story. We should talk. You should do, we should do a documentary on him. Um, but he, he started an organization for foster kids called now I'm known. And, one of the things that I do with my boys is just he has experienced um, in a different context, experienced a lot of the separation and fear and homelessness um, that a foster kid can go through. And so while we were um, fostering, you know, one of the things that he, as he and I like meditated on that. And then I, there's another guy, random guy, but I just want to give him a shout out. A guy named, uh, I wish I could remember his full name. His artist name is belief, belief or belief, uh, B E L E A F. Um, and he was doing a YouTube channel and he would do daily affirmations with his boys Wow! and they would go and they would stand in the, in the mirror, uh, look in the mirror in the bathroom. And then he would put lotion on their skin and they would, look at themselves and they would do these affirmations. And, um, so we, we do that with my sons, especially when they're in the hardest moments. Like I sit them down and I'm like, you, I need you to look at me and say, <coughs> like, I'm, I'm my, they say their full name and then they say, I'm loved, I'm safe, I'm valuable and I'm wanted. And then when they were really little, because we needed to do this, we would also say, why, why do you know that? Like, because, my mommy loves me. My daddy loves me. Jesus loves me. My friends love me. And they would just go through this list so that they would just hear it again and again and again. Like, this is who you are. No matter what you do, no matter what's been done to you. 
Like you are safe. You are loved. You are valuable. You are n- known. Like by saying all those things, we're saying to them, like, I know, I know you, I see you, but also you're saying it, like you're choosing to own that. And like, it's been amazing to watch. Like, I'm so thankful for those. Why aren't you guys. doing this movie? <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, I want to, I will, <laughs> I will. one day I, I'm scared to do my own story just yet. I'm not ready. Well, I think you're a character in that. Yeah. But you understand, you know, we talk about there's a difference between the story world and the story. Yes. You know, a story world is Star Wars. Yeah. And then within that, there's individual stories. Mm-hmm. And you're one of those. But, you know, a guy pitched me. He got so mad at me. It's in this video that I did for this film school thing. Uh, he called and said, hey, I want to do a story on adoption. I said, I'd love that. I said, I've been looking for something in that vein because it's yeah, kind yeah. of, it's been kind of coming up some people said i want to fund it so I, i'm listening yep and all of a sudden i said well, what's your angle like what's your story in that story world and he said i want to talk about corruption in the foster care system <laughs> and i was like <laughs> i said i'm not interested and he got really mad mm. and i said i'm sorry dude i said you know it's the best thing going it's yeah. what we have yeah and so how do we look at hope as kind of this antidote to some other things? And so I said, why don't you do a film called every kid needs a family? Mm. And he was like, I don't, I don't know anybody in that world. And I was like, we'll go find some families that have adopted kids and see what happens when you get a family. Mm. Cause I guarantee there'll be healing. There'll be hope. There'll be friendship. Mm. There'll be a whole different destination for their legacy. It's all there. I yes. said, it's, it's softball pitches. You just have yes. to find families that have adopted and figure out how they did it well and mm-hmm. the challenges they overcame, which is your struggles and your second act. And I was like, it's not that hard, but it, at the end of it, it maybe would change the perception mm-hmm. for people who are thinking about adoption, mm-hmm. you know, in the mm-hmm. foster care system. I was like, if you're not interested in it, you don't know anything about it, Yes, but real people doing this stuff. And, you know, I don't know, maybe you've experienced this differently, but it kind of feels like it's that Austin stone. Like I remember in, in where we were, it was like, it kind of was a campaign in some senses where it was like kind of cool to adopt. And I was yeah. like, well, yeah, but how do you get step into something like that if you're not educated on it? Right. So that's why we always talk about our films need to be entertaining. They need to be educational and they need to be inspiring. But mm. if they don't have those three components, we won't do it. Mm. And so, but that education part I'm learning really sets off the endorphins because people like to know what they don't know. Yes. I just think you have a huge opportunity to kind of open up a world for other people. No, that's, that's really good. I should, I should dive in that more. I've been wanting to stay home. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Just (laughs) film my family. Um, No, I think that, man, there's, there's so many thoughts with that. I I think there's an importance to that story. I think there's an importance to, yeah, people understanding, man, you can, I can go on about foster care. So we, I've always wanted to adopt. I always had, I just struggled with like, I don't really want my own. I don't need, I don't need more of me in the world and I don't need my own progeny. And if I can be a parent and there's a, someone who needs a parent, why wouldn't I be their parent instead of creating another <laughs> child that needs a parent like if there's already a need there and i have the resource to meet that need well let's go meet that need um that's rare though man yeah i don't i just it doesn't make sense any other way i mean my wife and i were like well i mean because we we explored you know do we do we have biological children first like i was just telling the story to someone they were like well how did you get where you are and he's a he's a fostered and adopted and uh, has a biological uh, daughter. And, you know, we were talking about how, you know, my wife and I got to a point where we were like, I don't even know if we want to have kids. Like we love what we do. We love caring for others. Why not just give ourselves like we're going to have more freedom to give freely. And that led to us exploring um, kind of that and just kind of came to the place of like, Oh no, we want to be parents. And, we knew we wanted to adopt at some point. Um, and the only reason that we ended up fostering, well, first we were like, well, let's 
we heard some counsel, hey, you should have a biological kid first if you're going to do that route. You don't want to flip the birth order, which I think is bullshit, just pure bullshit. Like I would never, ever counsel someone with that because I just don't think like you're going to disrupt everything. Like that's, you're bringing another human into your home and you're a bunch of broken pieces trying to love this other kid who's got a lot of broken pieces. And now like that's going to disrupt the home, whether they're biological or not, you're disrupting your home period. So anyways, uh, I'll get pa- <laughs> too passionate about that. But then we, uh, so we decided we actually did fertility tests. Like we couldn't have biological children, but the fertility test said we should be able to like, there was nothing wrong with either of us. And so we we're like, all right, cool. Well, let's just start pursuing adoption. And initially we were thinking about, because I worked um, with a bunch of friends in Zambia, uh, we were looking at exploring Zambia. So we got on the phone with the agency we were working with. We we're like, what about Zambia? And they're like, well, it's closed to international adoptions. We we're like, okay, cool. So we don't want to do international. Cause we don't really, we always feel like it's weird to like, like if there's kids here that have need homes, why adopt internationally? <laughs> like let's meet the immediate need first. Um, and so we were like, all right, cool. What's it look like for like an infant adoption here? And they were like, well, it's about a, you know, two to three year wait. And I looked at my wife on the phone, uh, we we're, you know, conference call. And I was like, uh, what, what do you think? She was like, well, I don't need a baby in my life. And I was like, cool. Yeah, I don't need a baby either. All right, what's the other option? She was like, foster care. And we were like, oh, you know, because immediately you have all this stigma from your thoughts on foster care, which, you know, to be fair, there's a lot of it that was true, um, but it's not the whole picture. And so we decided a few seconds later to be foster parents. And that's how we ended up fostering. Dude, I'm telling you, that would be, I think that's the doc mm. is, is foster care. I think, I, I think you're, you're convincing me. I'm telling you, cause I have a friend that just went through a really tough situation and I mean, the stories are there, but yes. then there's also Greg. I mean, the cast is like right at your fingertips. Yeah. Oh man, I could probably list off 10 people right now. Right. That would be a excellent interview and in stories that didn't finish well, stories that hurt. And I think that that would be powerful too, because I think one of my biggest just passions that I want to work through in film is how to tell stories that aren't resolved, but the film's resolved, if that makes sense. Yeah. And how do you live in that? And how do I leave people? I read, I'm reading this phenomenal series of books called the stormlight archives. It's a fantasy series and it, I've just needed to step away from nonfiction, but there's a quote in there where he says that the purpose of a storyteller is to, is to uh, is too often confused in that instead of teaching people how to ask better questions or uh, asking encouraging them to ask questions we try to tell them something and like i'm butchering the quote but it was i wrote it down immediately because i was like this literally describes my where i want to go this is like you put that one in the wh auden together and i'm like that's that's the basis for every film i want to create is how do i show broken people loving broken people and then how do i show get the audience to ask questions at the end and not feel like they've i've given them an answer but that's rare dude i mean it from a faith standpoint churches mm-hmm. don't do that no <laughs> i mean they tell you i mean it's like you already know the third act before you even start yes. the movie <laughs> yes it's just this you're trying to figure out how literal they're going to be about it what's well, scary it's scary not to, to, to ask those questions. You know, I think that's, that goes back to that, that depression I went through in in college. So for the first time in my life, I had to ask, I, I didn't have a choice. Like I was confronted would be the best word with, with questions I didn't have answers to. And the world was unraveling around me. And I, in hindsight, I'm so thankful for that journey. Like, I don't think I could have been a filmmaker 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. Like I've needed this process and now I feel like I'm, you know, I'm 40 years old and I feel like for the first time I'm doing what I'm created to do. Like this is, it's what I love. I'm like passionate about it. I don't care if I'm working or not working. Like I just love doing it. I mean, I spent all weekend modifying lenses (laughs) and my wife's like, you're such a nerd. I'm like, it's going to serve the purpose of telling this story better. Like it's not just gear. Like to me, these are, 
tools, tools to tell a better story. And yeah. that at the end of the day, if I can tell a, a better story that changes the way someone views something and causes them to take action on that, man. Yeah. It was worth it. Yeah. We say, we, we always say we're in the thinking product. We're in the thinking business. Yeah. Because we help people think differently about the world. Mm, that's good. Um, the back of your lenses, did you change them to EF or what did you yes. E? Yes. I changed them to the EF. I used Simod um, to adapt all of them. And so the nice ones, the Simod. Yeah. They're like a hundred bucks each. Oh, they're yes. Is it worth it? Yes. Oh, I can't pull the trigger. I'm Dude, having a hard time on it. I was, I was too. So I, I was, and I bought all loose. I w- bought those photo deox yeah, ones. Suck. They are horrible. Yeah, especially the for the Nikon. Yeah, you get the play, and then so yours work. Oh, they work great. I can help you if you want. <laughs> like they're so. I just don't want to spend five hundred bucks. Yeah, they're running a sale right now. <laughs> Gosh, you didn't say that. My wife's over there on the other side. She's like, what? <laughs> you should. Um, so I put. Their follow focus gears are phenomenal. I have those already done. Okay. It's the back. That's the it's only just thing the I've back. done. Just the back. Do it. Yeah. How, how big is your set? Oh, six, eight. Okay. Well, There's 79. Good. They're running a deal right now. It's like 20% off and free shipping. Really? Yeah. You I'll, have to look, you'll have to look at them when we're done. Okay. You should do it because, so all you do on that, that's why I liked the Nikon over, because I wanted, originally I was going to go after the FD because, I mean, they're just beautiful yeah and but then i picked up the nikons i was like i think these are better like they don't have the same character as the fd but i think they're actually i like them more and what i do is i pair them with my sigmas because my sigmas become my interview and then the nikons become everything else yeah yeah and it works so well like the sigma in the interview just i wanted that crispness i didn't want it so soft Whereas I shoot everything else wide open on those Nikons. And I think that the adapting it was worth it. I first, I did it slowly. So I did three and then literally three days later, I bought the next round because I was like, I got to do this. Yeah, so they, I, they don't work well for interviews though. Uh, yeah. They're too soft. They're too soft. Yes. Yeah. I just did one with an interview. So I'm intrigued. I, so I have the 35, I, didn't like it. I have the 35, one, four, and the 51.4. And I felt like the 50 and the 35 are sharp enough. Yeah. The 28 F2 that I have is a, if I don't shoot it at 2.8, it's too soft. Yeah. But if I shoot it 2.8, it's sharp enough. Yeah. It and, starts to just get, it, it just starts to get wonky around the edges. And so yes. I feel like it distracts from what the character is saying. Totally. And so I used it in a lot of interviews and you have to have a lot of light. We had to have a lot of light with this rig we were using. Mm. But the funny thing is I can't find many DPs that know how to use them. Mm, really? Yeah. They, they can't, they get really. They, is it because the focus gear is backwards? It's and backwards. It's smaller. Yep. It's like they can't, it's not traditional. Like mm. it's, they get, they get a little bit. Huh. And so I like that. Yeah. I'm like, are you a DP that learned off YouTube and like you really have a style right. or is it, they, they, everything is so boxed in. I was like, it's the imperfection is what I want. Yes. So. Well, and I, like, I just had a, um, uh, a DP that like, I saw something that he had produced. So I, on Instagram, I was like, what lens did you use? Cause that's gorgeous. <laughs> and he sends me the lens and it's one of the Ari, like, uh, or ingenue, like I forget 15 to 45 or something like oh, that. Yeah. I looked it up. I was like, that's a 40 or that's a $30,000 lens. I was yeah. like, I'm never shooting on that. Cause well, I, cause I think I could get something equally as good. Yeah. You know, like I was telling my buddy the other day, I was like, they want he from my, the, the church I work at, we were trying to build out a different kit and, and he was looking at my lens. And he was like, well, why don't we just buy your Nikons? And I was like, bro, it's going to be like, this full set's probably going to be like 3000 bucks. Like, I mean, it's took a lot of work. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, 3,000, that new 28 to 105 from Canon costs 3,000 oh, yeah, <laughs> and you yeah. get six lenses yeah. instead of that. And I was like, oh, okay. All right. Well, and I'm about to shoot this YouTube thing on this new camera. We got this, we, I've actually gone to, we're actually shooting. It's the, it's the wide on this as a video camera. Mm. And what I realized is I'm shooting this, um, I'm working on this thing up in Oregon that we've been up there on and I was shooting it on C70 but I need to be in the room deep mm. a lot. People don't care Mm-mm. if it's an access film, if it's about getting access to people, 
they don't care. Mm-mm. They want to have, they want to be in the room. So I started, I got this three ship camera and rigged it out with audio. And I use that thing all the time. No way. Oh yeah. And people are like, what is that? That's a video camera. I was like, yep. And, but they know my reputation. So I kind of have a little you bit have of that, edge. You have that clout. Yeah. But I'm like, when you're watching the movie, they don't, they, they want to see a story and yeah. then they forget that it wasn't shallow focus. And all of a sudden it's just given me so much more freedom mm. and I love it. I mm. absolutely love it. Yeah. The picture's not there. I mean, mm. it's not, it's a step down from like a C70 or C300, right. but as far as like run and gun and being able to be in places I could never get to with the C70 mm. cause it just, it's too, even that small camera, it, they see it, they see yeah. the mic and the fur and all that. They just kind of, that's cool. Yeah. No, I think that the um, two stories that were so instrumental in my career as a photographer, one was I had a guy who said to me one day, you know, I was looking at new equipment, you know, back then it was a 5D Mark II that I wanted to get, I think. No, I might have even been shooting on a Rebel still, or it was a new lens, I forget. And I was like complaining, and he, and he said to me, he said, Josh, you you need to learn how to use the, the equipment that you have until the limit or till the, um, just the, the limits of that equipment yeah. inhibit your creativity. Yes. But until you've maxed out that point, he's like, learn how to use them until you cannot, until you cannot do something that you creatively want to do and you know how to do it. And that equipment's keeping you from it, then stop using it. But until that happens, don't think getting better equipment will make you better at all. So that was like lesson number one. The second one that like just solidified that was when I learned about, I forget, I wish I I should look this up. So I know the, the photographer's name so I can credit him, but there was a fashion photographer in New York that had like a setup going, got everything going, got the models all in, you know, huge production, like, like Vogue level. And they go to get set up and he starts taking pictures and he has just a bucket full of disposable cameras and he does the entire shoot with disposable cameras and like they thought he was just doing his prep shots and he finishes the shoot and he's like all right we're done and they walked off and the client was like what are you doing and he's like we're done this is this is the creative parameters you gave me for the shoot this will accomplish that the best and he was done and they printed them and they were amazing and everybody loved them because everybody else was trying to get so scientific with their approach and the lighting was perfect. And he just used disposable cameras and he took something that was perfect, this model and this beautiful gown and put it on an imperfect image and it was relatable and it was juxtaposed and that contrast created a beauty. And I don't know. I've always loved that story. Yeah. And I think that applies to documentary across the board, especially, I mean, I think there's a difference between doing a Netflix show And I mean, I've worked on some of those big shows and it's like, it's very, very structured Hmm. and they, you know, they're owned. What I can't figure out why people don't kind of get this is I'm like, Netflix is a public company. Hmm. Like every quarter they have to show profits. They know they use AI. They use everything to know exactly what that documentary is going to do and how many viewers, you know, are going to show up. So it's not, th- th- that stuff's very calculated. They since, you know, they spent $16.4 billion in 2020 on content. So as an independent film, oh, yeah. what's going to separate yourself is you only have one trigger. It's the yes. story. Yes. So, you know, oh, is this Netflix qualified? Well, it doesn't matter if you don't tell a story that's so outrageously good that it competes with $16.4 billion. Yeah. So if they sent 16.4, they got to make 30 to be able to show their investors that this is actually working. So that machine is different than an independent film where my creativity is really my biggest tool. Mm -hmm. So whatever camera I'm using, I need to, I need to focus on how that is actually producing a story. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the hardest thing to convince this next generation that like nobody cares. Right. That just get a camera and start shooting and learn to tell good stories. But this, the, the consumer machine is really, really heavy. It's so heavy. And, you know, I loved, um, 
I love one of the things I say that they regularly said, Michael Del Monte and uh, Mark Bone saying the AOD community is you're not a, you're not a filmmaker until you've finished a film. Oh, that's good. Right. there. And I just think it's like, that, that's true. Like one of the biggest things, so they do these, you know, I've, you've probably seen it, their one day doc festival. Um, and it's been such a great, resource for me because it gives me this impetus. I've got six weeks to do a documentary. I can only shoot it in one day and it has to be, it's so all the parameters built in and it just forces me every time I try to give myself some new challenge. So this last one, it was no interview, like sit down interview. I'm going to follow someone throughout their day and I'm only going to use one camera and one lens, like no external lighting, nothing like just try to make it as simple as possible and just see if I can create a story out of it. And it was really fun to just test and try and like it forces me to grow but fi having to finish it i think that's the biggest thing because i've seen some of the younger guys i work with like i've seen them like they love exploring old cameras i mean the fuji x100v is just like blowing up yeah. right now i'm like you could also learn film and just <laughs> shoot the same thing with the film you just can't get it to your cell phone as fast um but some of it is finishing something and and also story i mean instagram has been is like the biggest battle against story and also the greatest opportunity because if I can capture somebody's attention in 90 seconds or in, well, really if I can capture it in the first five seconds Oh yeah, and keep them there for 90, man, have you seen the 60 that. second docs? The, yeah, the, like the oh. one, the, isn't it like the called Instagram one channel? minute, one minute docs or something like that or 60 yeah. second docs. I mean, that should tell you everything. Yeah. Cause it's like, those are documentaries that I'm going, if you don't get my attention, I'm going to swipe and I got right. a hundred, a thousand other docs I can watch. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a really great tool to be able to kind of think of where's your hook in the short form, mm -hmm. you know, long form. I think you got a little bit more real estate because yep. people's kind of how they sit down and they're experiencing something. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I think it's really the thing that I'm really learning is this distribution side. Hmm. If you want to make a living at it, you know, it's like you have a job that kind of supplements your creativity, but people who are trying to just be a filmmaker, it's a difficult run. I mean, you probably Absolutely. know from photography, it's like, it's a hustle all the time. Yes. And how do you create a balance of life? I mean, obviously you figured that out. It, it, ish. <laughs> ish. I don't know. I think I'm still figuring it out. If anything, maybe figuring it out right now is knowing that I haven't figured it out. Yeah, that works. I hey. mean, that, that balance of life is tough. I will say. Oh yeah. I mean, it's way tough. Yeah. So I, I think a lot of guys just, and, and then the responsibility increases, they get married, they buy a home. It's like, then all of a sudden it's a different world and they don't necessarily have the consistency or whatever. I, you know, most docs come from trust funders. I mean, yeah. it's the reason for it. Yeah. You know, so that makes sense. Yeah. Or you get one of Netflix billions to yeah, <laughs> produce exactly. something like Beckham or Pepsi. Where's my jet? Well, we have this film on this guy, Dave Mira. And, um, it's funny. This guy and Dave Mira. Well, <laughs> I like how you say that. Well, <laughs> I mean, yeah. like childhood hero. <laughs> yeah. So we've been working on that and, realizing for like Netflix, he's not a big enough name or HBO. So it should tell you where the market is right. as far as the choices you make in content. It's like, you can't guarantee there's, but there's a huge audience. It's just, you got to think through the distribution that's much differently. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, either that or you have the, the story <laughs> to go back to your point. If the story is, well, I mean, yeah, that's the funny part is the story is totally there. Really? Oh my gosh, dude. And I can't tell anybody about it yet because we haven't, we've got to go. We've already archived everything. Okay. We need to go back there for two weeks. Then we've got to go see Laird Hamilton and Travis Pastrana. I mean, <laughs> those are the last two. That's amazing. And it's all lined up. We just got to go. We just don't have the funding yet. Oh my goodness. So, I can't wait to see that. Yeah. It's, it's the most crazy I mean, we've interviewed Tony Hawk for that. I mean, major people. And I it's mean, just sitting there. Mira's impact. Yeah. It, it transcends. I mean, but the story let alone the, the video game. <laughs> well, and the funny part is the story is about what does it look like to transition from being an all-star world-class athlete to the next phase of life. Mm. And so it's a story about identity. It's a story about legacy. It's a story about you know, what does it mean to transition? What does it mean to have a family? I mean, it, there's so many, I mean, it's way bigger than cycling. I think that's rad. I mean, those are the best stories I think. Yeah. 
is the ones that are way bigger than anything. I mean, there's a story about, about addiction, suicide. I mean, there are some major themes that nobody in the public knows about yet. Mm. So that's, that's really good. There is a, a documentary a long time ago that I watched. I wish I could remember the name of it about, uh, David Cho. He's a artist, a graffiti artist. And like, you know, he's unbelievable. Oh, you know him. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's I, amazing. Yeah. His work is amazing. His story is amazing. And I remember f- seeing that piece and being like, this is so good. Mm-hmm. And then similarly, like the documentary done on Christian Hansoy, like, and just his story. And just, I think, you know, that I don't know what it is about the skate BMX world, but oh, <laughs> they produce man. amazing stories. Yeah. And the, and it's a different community. I, it I really like, is. But I used to ride BMX, and then you know I liked skateboarding and all that stuff. And so now, uh, being in the room with these guys, they're very protective. So mm. like all the OGs in that world, we'd sit down at lunch, and I was like, hey, you know, they're. I mean, they are not interested in me sitting at the table. And I was like, well, what about this? And they're like, oh, you're one of us. Mm. And I'll never forget Mark Losey said that to me, and I was like. I am. And he's like, yeah, he's like, you understand, like your heart's in this. Mm. And they said, he goes, I'll help you. That's cool. But I mean, gatekeepers, bro. Like yeah. no joke with that. Like they are not like they were. Yeah. And then we finally, you know, like Dennis McCoy and Tony and all those guys, they were super rad, but they were like, we need to know where you're standing on this. Yeah. Is this some puff piece for, you know, one of the big majors or not. And I was like, no, 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 I want to do this because I want to do it right. That's rad. So That's rad. Hey, oh man, that's good. Before we go. Yes. Um, that's tell good. Me, I should look at my, make sure I can get to get my boys on time. Yeah. So tell me this, where are you? What are you working on? And then how can people find your work? Yeah. Um, where am I? Hmm. I'm here in Lafayette, Colorado. Yeah. Uh, and traveling whenever I can, <laughs> whenever I have space in my schedule. Uh, what am I working on right now? My next project, I'm developing my next project. I'm trying to figure out what's next. Uh, so, you know, for my day job, I'm telling stories for our church community, um, which has been rad. We, they just recently launched our team. We're called the story impact team. And our job is basically short form documentary all day long. Like it's really rad. So, and we get a lot of creative freedom to just go explore. Basically it feels like I have a patron and the job is just to tell stories of broken people having their lives changed and the, and not necessarily like always everything's changed and everything's good, but the process, the journey of that. Um, so that's, that's day to day. But then I also, I really want to do this documentary about, my dad, my parents, and I don't know what it is yet. I haven't fully, it's one that I know is there. I mean, there's so many stories that I'm trying to identify. I really want to like wrestle with aging. I just don't know if I've, if he's ready, if he wants to talk that deeply about that. Um, but just watching him age, I want to, I just think there's a beauty in, I think a lot of people are so afraid of aging. We're so afraid of that and I, I think my dad navigates it really well, but it's also been really hard, um, especially this last year. Is he's given up surfing, and so yeah, that'll that's the next kind of Halo project that I'm working on. Can and, I can I throw something out? Yes, not to distract. No, but this is good. My um, we've we did this for a friend, but their parents are getting older and they're just getting ready to have kids. Mm. And so they're trying to figure out how are my grandkids, how is it, how are they going to get to know their grandparents? So they had us come in and do all these interviews, like six and a half hours of interviews with their parents uh-huh. and then cut it down to be able to condense their family values. That's cool. Were. And so I would just say, you that know, could be fun. If anybody, nobody ever sees it. Yeah. Man, just record it. Totally. And take the, you know, if you can get your dad to sit down with the video camera and just say, hey, I don't know if I'm going to do anything with it other than I want this in 20 years from now. Totally. And that's, I think that's what I'm coming to with this piece is like, it may never see the light of day outside of my family, but it could. And I want to shoot it with that in mind and give it everything I've got. Yeah. And the corollary to that is I really, I've had, there's this song, I don't know, you know, the band Thrice, Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite 
artists for a long time, but they have this song called Words in the Water that I've loved and no one's ever done a music video on it. I'd have to get their permission, I'm sure, to ever release it, but I want to film it because I have a vision for what it could be and I think it could be beautiful. And so it could be my first tentative dive into narrative okay. to like try to put something together that's a little more impressionistic. Um, I don't I haven't decided if I want to go like impressionistic or an experimental or go actual narrative and try to tell the story in its own visual language. But yeah, those are, that's what I'm working on right now. And how can people find out what you're up to? Um, well, they can come talk to me because <laughs> I'm the worst at posting things and keeping people updated. Uh, you know, you can find me on uh, Instagram. It's just Josh Loves Light. So that's kind of what I've named my my personal work. Um, just Josh Loves Light, joshloveslight.com. Um, and then on Instagram and, and LinkedIn, those are probably the places that I interact with people. But yeah, you can find me there. You can reach out, say what's up. And I would be more than happy. I love talking to people. Cool, so. man. Yeah. Thank hey, you. Thanks for doing this. Oh my goodness. This has been like, I was telling you at the beginning, like I've never done a, a, a podcast and I mean, I just feel so, you know, I think I, I, I see what you've created and really look up to the work that you've done and am inspired by it. So I'm really honored to be sitting across the table, learning, listening, and getting to share. Oh, that's good, man. Well, until next time. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. All right. All right.